as somebody who spent so much time in healthcare, what eventually came to be such a huge point of not just frustration, but absolute rage were the lies. The lies from the medical professionals. Jill, how did you find Carnival? Um, it was, uh, you could say I took the scenic route. So uh, I started off uh, with uh, vegetarianism and then went into veganism. And this was right after I was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic. Uh, and eventually those two ways of eating, um, the vegetarianism to veganism, both of them I did for about three years. And I got worse and worse and worse and weaker and more um, type 2 diabetes symptoms, uh, starting with uh, neuropathy, with peripheral neuropathy. It started in my feet. I thought it was an issue with having spent the majority of my professional life on my feet. Um, from the 90s in through, I would say, probably the mid-2010s, or 20 teens, um, I had a kind of dual certification. I was a massage therapist as well as an x-ray tech. So on my feet all the time. And, you know, that kind of resulted in varicosities and things like that. So you start getting leg cramps and, you know, I just thought it was a natural byproduct. Um, I had had uh, injuries from when I was a kid, um, multiple breaks, as it were, or actually massive tears in my uh, tendons and ligaments of my ankles from ice skating and horseback riding and falls that I had taken and things of that nature. And um, I just thought, okay, well, this is just me getting older. This is, this is getting older. This is getting older. So I went and I had my veins done, which was wonderful. It was great. Um, you know, or as many of them as they could get to. There's, it, it's, it's ugly in there sometimes. <laughs> but um, the idea was that I shouldn't be feeling this horrible, stabbing pain. And it, it, literally, when people tell you that they're, they're, neuropathy is so bad that they just twitch their leg spasms, their foot spasms, something spasms, and they can't control it. It's, you know, it's almost uh, something out of a cartoon, you know, that old fashioned um, just whack, like you're going to whack somebody behind you, your hand just flies back or your foot flies up, like you're kicking somebody in a, a SNL skit. That's not, that's not hyperbole and that's not exaggeration. And it is excruciating. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, it had got to a point where, uh, are you familiar with Ugg boots? Though the winter boots? Okay. Imagine a pair of Ugg boots that go up to just underneath your knee. And they are filled with the finest shards of crystal that are white, molten hot, and your feet are shoved into them 24 seven, and you can't escape it under any circumstances. It makes you realize why people can actually beg doctors to um, amputate limbs. That's how searing and constant the pain was. So sorry to interrupt, but just to clarify that you don't even have to be standing up to experience this pain. You could be lying down, no weight on your feet. Yeah, lying down. A, a, a wisp of air can make you want to scream. It can bring tears to your eyes. Um, it, your feet are burning, but you want to cool them. You can't put water or ice on them. You can't wrap them in something because part of you is so cold because deep inside you're not getting the circulation. Your vessels have deteriorated to the point due to the inflammatory process that the, you know, your, your feet are turning or your tips of your toes are turning yellow. 
and they start to lose their pinkish color. And I, I've been in healthcare for over 30 years. So I've seen this happen to people and I've seen them, or this is one of the first stages before you start getting real diabetic problems with your feet. And when that started happening and I realized I couldn't even do my job because my feet touching the floor or touching a sheet or putting on a pair of socks just made me want to scream. I knew I had to do something. So that happened. It got that bad during the vegan phase of my um, experiment, my self-experiment here. Um, I learned I was type two diabetic. So I basically knew that it was a lifestyle thing. And I'd always been, always been overweight, always been the chubby kid, but I'd always been also pretty active. Um, ice skating, roller skating, uh, biking. Um, I hated running. So that was out of the question. Although in all fairness, at that particular point in time, um, I was trying to increase my cardiovascular proficiency with um, running on the treadmill. So I, I think that kind of offset a lot of the uh, potential problems for a long time. Um, I had gotten up to a point where I had done my absolute best. Nobody would have ever considered I could do this was actually run seven miles in an hour with a combination of uh, sprinting and jogging. And it was great. It was, it was my high point. I went, yay, okay, patted myself on the back and went, okay, now I don't ever have to do that again. But, <laughs> but I love sprinting. So um, I was watching your uh, interview with Houston uh, earlier today, and she was talking about how she was into sprinting and weightlifting and all that stuff too. Now she went, she went miles into the, um, you know, body reformation and, you know, God bless, man. I never had the, uh, the stomach, pardon the pun, uh, to do that or the wherewithal. Um, I, I weight lifted, um, because I liked to know that I was able to do my job it was more for practicality sake than for any kind of, you know, beauty or vanity, um, which irked my family to no end. Uh, as the chubby kid, as a female, I, I'm sure you can imagine it's, it's just as bad for boys when they're the chubby boys um, that, you know, oh, well, nobody's ever going to want you if you're not skinny or if you're not thin enough or if you're not fit enough. But as a girl, you don't want to weight lift. Oh, no, 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 no. Heaven forbid you do that. You'll get all muscly and veiny. And ooh, nobody's going to want that. Who's going to want to marry you if you look like that? Okay. Well, who said I wanted to get married? And if I did, I think it would hopefully be a little bit more me than actually what I look like. You know, that would that would um, kind of engage somebody's interest. Neither here nor there. But that's one of those things that shapes how we have our relationships with food is is dealing with the expectations that others put on us because those are the expectations that they had. Um, our family members, our, our parents, they're just, you know, they just want the best for us because that's what they were programmed with by their parents. Um, in so many cases, they don't really see us as individuals, anybody, it doesn't matter. It's not, they just see us as mini thems until we, you know, eventually emerge into either our own adulthood at which point sometimes we're lucky enough to escape or until you get so rebellious that they just decide to throw up their hands and give up on you. But uh, anyway, so I tried the lifestyle change uh, going back to the uh, whole original diagnosis. I thought, well, what's what I, what don't I do right? And I thought, well, okay, vegetarianism, 
everybody says meat's bad for you. Fatty meat's bad for you. Um, you don't want your cholesterol to grow, uh, to go up. You, uh, you know, so I went vegetarian. I thought, okay, I can eat the fish. I, I like salmon and I like white fish. Well, not, you know, like grouper and stuff like that. Um, but I can eat primarily veggies and I love vegetables and fruits. Although I knew I had to go easy on the fruits because fructose and the sugars that are inherent in fruit. And like so many others that you've interviewed, almost every single one of us who went the vegetarian or vegan route did it because we plugged into the YouTube um, algorithm and we searched up healthy diet for some reason or other. And um, as somebody who spent so much time in healthcare, what eventually came to be such a huge point of not just frustration, but absolute rage were the lies. The lies from the medical professionals. After my initial diagnosis, I found a primary care physician, sought one out so that I could get on metformin and start to get control of this as there was no way you know my whole big thing was that i am not going to go to my grave having lost my bits along the way i want every part of me as intact as possible <laughs> when i hit that six feet under well first thing i did was i found a new doctor relatively new been in practice for just a couple of years a female who, um, given their, uh, this is going to be sound really horrible, but given the fact that um, their nationality was what it was, I thought, well, they'll probably be more open-minded about wanting to change diet and increase positive habits and things like that. No, I was wrong. And I'm sitting there uh, in the doctor's office waiting to meet this woman. And they had told me to, you know, change, put on the gown or put on the little thingy because it was a half gown. And they, they assumed that I was there for a well woman check. That's not what I put in the box. And you know, I'm sitting there in my shirt and I'm like, no, I'm not putting that thing on. I'm not here for that. So she walks in and she says, um, you have to put that on and then you get to lay back and then just, you know, and I'm like, um, no. So right away I knew, okay, she's not even going to listen. So I tell her, she, you know, finally says, oh, okay. And I tell her that I'm there for diabetes, yada, yada, yada. And that I want to, um, to discuss healthy eating habits with her and uh, the right types of food and things of that nature. And she just looked at me and she said, you'll never change your diet. You'll never change. And, and so I fired her on the spot and I walked out, <laughs> um, got another referral, tried a different doctor at the same place. Um, and his whole thing was, well, you can try, um, but you're not going to fail or you're going to fail. You know, you're not going to make it. So I'm going to put you on statins and yeah, I'll give you the metformin. And then we'll talk about insulin after three months. And yeah, that was my reaction was like, excuse me, you, you know nothing about me. So I gave up. I absolutely 100% gave up dealing with medical professionals because I worked with them all the time anyway. It's different when you work with them than when you're the patient. And I mean, I'm sure we all know that. So I went to YouTube and that's when I started the, the ball rolling and, and um, what is it? Forks over knives and, and um Oh God, was it Joe Cross and his, um, his, I was like a bloated sheep and, uh, his juicing, um, God, I can't remember what it was, 
but um, all the stuff, um, Frankensteer and um, who is it? Uh, Dr. Furman, Michael Greger, Mike the Vegan, Happy Healthy Vegan, um, Freely the Banana Girl. Well, I, you know, I gotta love Freely and Durian Rider, whatever their their issues were. But uh, I can't eat bananas because they give me heartburn. They give me heartburn because they're so high in carbs. I was at a point where I was eating, you know, those big bottles of Tums that you get on the grocery. I was going through one of those at least every week or two. I had so much heartburn all the time. I'm like, I'm not going to have any stomach acid left. My body's just going to stop producing acid. But I couldn't take it. It was, you know, burning in the esophagus and just sick to the stomach. And then all of a sudden you're constipated because you've got so much sodium bicarb in you. It's just all, you know, turning into a brick inside of you. Um, <laughs> it was just awful. And I started, eventually I had got to the point where I thought, okay, this happens after I eat beans or after I eat something with rice, or after I eat, um, you know, one of those gorgeous gourmet bagels with the everything on it, and, you know, tons of butter and cream cheese and all that stuff. And I thought, well, I know it can't be the butter and it can't be the cream cheese because I eat cheese outside of this. So it had to be the carbohydrates. And sure enough, so I started throwing all that out. And that's when I kind of went more vegan. And I tried doing the, you know, super low fat, you know, oh, throw the olive oil on it. Well, all of our olive oil is adulterated. And as somebody who just works with doctors, I'm no doctor. I don't make that kind of money. So I can't always afford olive oil, like the real stuff. But, you know, you just get to this, this awful place where uh, you're, all you're eating is greens. All you're eating is greens. And I wasn't losing weight. I didn't get into it to lose weight. I knew that that was a component of getting rid of type 2 diabetes. Um, I'd never been into or interested in what the scale says, per se. That was my parents. That was my grandmother. That was the, the matriarchal line of my family was so obsessed with the scale all my life. And not just what I weighed, but what they weighed. So I learned a lot of bad stuff from a really young age. I was the first seven-year-old to ever be at Weight Watchers. And yeah. And I, I, I you know, I, I was chubby, but I was not by any stretch of the imagination obese at that point in time. And it was always that, oh, just 10 pounds, just 10 pounds. And it was the same thing with every woman in Weight Watchers. The handful of men kind of hung back and they kind of reluctantly did their thing because their wives made them do it or whatever. But the women would talk about, you know, oh, well, you know, I, I had to purge three times yesterday. I had to, you know, I have, I haven't eaten anything but broth and then I just swirled it around my mouth and spit it out. So I'm really proud of myself because I haven't eaten in, you know, like, um, you know, four days. Well, have you made a poo? Because look at your face. You, you, you look like you're constipated. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you have constipation face. So, and this is me at seven going, I don't want to be like any of these women. Um, so, uh, you know, the two of them went hand in hand, having this history of watching women hurt themselves and being proud of the damage that they're doing to their bodies for a quarter of a pound loss in a week. Ooh, big deal. A quarter of a pound. Oh my God. And they would celebrate and jump for joy. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, and you want me to get on the scale? And if somebody gained a quarter of a pound, they were in tears. They were crying. Like, I didn't eat. I didn't. Well, you have to have fuel to burn. Even as a kid, 
I knew the correlation between having been outside playing all day till the streetlights came on and being really hungry when I got home <laughs> and eating all my dinner because I needed it. Um, so uh, you get this, this roundabout thing and you eventually come back or I come back to the whole um, having slid into this vegan thing and no meat, no eggs. I had lived on eggs, beans, and rice for a long time while I was a student. And that's probably part of what did some of the damage. Uh, but everybody was touting beans. Beans, they're great for you. They're high in fiber. I hated beans. Hated them with a passion. I loved green beans. But kidney beans, even butter beans, they were just like giant balls of cotton that would explode in my mouth. And I'm like, what is tasty about this? So I'm going to choke on this. It's going to get stuck going down here, and you're going to have to reach down there and pull it out when you're doing CPR on me. So you're effectively punishing yourself on a daily basis, right? <laughs> yes, because I listened to what so-called experts were saying about the validity of the vegan way. Oh, well, look at me. Look at me. I'm so healthy. I'm so great. I go and do this and I climb mountains and I, you know, ride 300,000 miles a day on my bike and up and down mountains all the time. And, and in the back of my brain was always the question, you've never been diabetic, have you? But if you want to be healthy and look healthy, then you have to live the healthy lifestyle. And that was that equation that was arguing with the common sense in the back of my head. Now, 15 years before I got diagnosed as diabetic, my brother was diagnosed as diabetic. And I very clearly remember being in his hospital room and sitting with him and letting him test his prowess with the uh, Lancet device on my fingers and asking him, well, why don't you just stop eating starches and breads and stuff like that and just eat meat? And his response to me was that the lady who told him, the lady who came to him from the Diabetes Education Center said that the body will turn the meat into sugar anyway. So you might as well just eat the carbs. That's another thing that stuck in my head. And I didn't know much about diabetes. Nobody, nobody who's not into it or nobody who's not a part of it really gets a lot of it unless you're a researcher. Or And, and I swear to God, they try to occlude what information they have just to keep people stupid, just to keep people uneducated. And that's one of those things that just plugs in the rage, you know? Um, so uh, the veganism is where everything turned horrible for me, where that neuropathy came up and came in and just tore me down to nothing emotionally. And I had been active all my life. Heavy, yes, I always said I'd rather be a little bit overweight and be healthy than to be sick and skinny because that was what I had seen over at Weight Watchers. As a child, I had seen all these skinny size zero, size two, size five women. And I'm a size 10, 12 at the time, you know, not, not at the Weight Watchers, but um, and later on, and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take being a 10, 12 and being healthy, knowing that I can get out there and I can cross the monkey bars and, you know, I can, I can bike ride, you know, 20 miles if I have to. And, you know, I can climb a tree. I can go hiking and not have to worry about having the strength to get back. And somewhere along the line in the healthcare field, I kind of lost that. I lost that sense of what actually made sense or the willingness to follow what made sense in my innate knowledge, if that makes any sense. Um, 
And it took a lot for me to get back to that. And one of the things that kept coming up, again, during all this healthy eating, healthy eating, healthy eating stuff and these videos that I was watching, and I fell into, I dove into it. I didn't fall into it. I dove into the veganism. Lock, stock, barrel, head first or feet first, whichever way you want to talk about it. And I bought the inconsistencies and I bought the mental gymnastics required to believe in it because I wanted the hope. I wanted to believe that this was going to cure me. I knew that there was a cure for diabetes type 2. I knew it. But nobody would acknowledge it. It's always about manage it, manage it, manage it. Sure, so you can put me on that downward death spiral of drug use. Give me this. That gives me this side effect. That gives me this side effect so that I can take another drug. And how many times have you heard it, Dave? How many times have you heard people saying they went from one drug to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and before you knew it, that they were just like, <clears throat> they can't do anything. So then one day, this, this thumbnail pops up, and there's this guy standing there, and he's in a you know lab coat, and he's like, wait a minute, where is it? And he's like this. And it was Dr. Barry. And the thumbnail said something like, you know, control your type 2 diabetes or what they don't tell you about diabetes or something like that. And I'm like, I'm ready for this. One of the things that really, this was back when he was just a keto guy. This was well before he went into carnivore. Um, one of the things that really impressed me about him was his humility. When he came out and he said, I can't believe I gave so many patients this wrong information because I didn't know any better. I'm like, oh my God, this is a guy I think I could talk to. It, <laughs> exactly. So once I clicked on him, then yes, it started that whole circuit. Um, I didn't necessarily go with the Joe Rogan, um, although, you know, I did love his DMT special that he did, <laughs> which was wonderful. But um, I was like, okay, that's, that's muscle guy stuff. That's, I, I just want to recover. I just want to be healthy again. So I started going more with the clinicians, um, Ken Berry, Georgia Ede, um, Jason Fung, Paul Mason, the Low Carb Down Under crew. And I started learning and learning and learning and learning. And finally, I just went, okay, I have to at least try keto. I have to start integrating more meat. And sure enough, I went back to being kind of an omnivore and chooching away some of those high carb things. But as a chubby kid, that little chubby kid is still inside. And she says, I want a bagel. <laughs> and so I would buy the bagel and I'd cut it in half and cut each half in half, and I would have a quarter of a bagel. So I learned slowly about the moderation aspect of things. So my journey has actually taken a long, long time for me to get to the point that I'm at now, which I'll get to in just a moment. <laughs> uh -huh. So ju just out of interest, um, what, what, what's the kind of time around where you had discovered Ken Berry? Uh, about three years. So it was about three years ago that uh, I discovered him. So, Actually, yeah, I think actually it might have been 2020, so it might be four years now. So I did a lot of this um, toward, it would have been toward the end of 2020 because through 2020 and uh, COVID slash Snowvid, uh, which down in Texas was a horrible thing that uh, February, but um, it was still housebound and I was teaching uh, from the house and stuff like that. 
And in between, I had a day class and a night class. So in between, I loved it because I could go take a nap. I didn't have the energy to do anything else. They tell you when when you're vegan, these guys, these these um, Dr. Furman's and, and Dr. Gregor's and all these people, they tell you, oh, the weight's going to drop right off of you and you don't have to exercise. You don't have to do anything. You can just lay there and it's going to fall right off of you. Well, that's a dream for anybody who's ever been chubby is not having to do anything. But what they don't tell you is that you don't have the energy to do anything because your muscle is eating itself. You are cannibalizing yourself and you're getting toffee. Okay. If you're losing weight, you're getting toffee. You're losing muscle and your fat is staying right where it's at. And I, I couldn't get on the treadmill. If I could get down on the floor and do a, a push up or just some ball exercises, if I could do that for 10 minutes, I was doomed for the rest of the day. It was all I could do to crawl to the couch and just sleep until my alarm went off for my night class. And it was it was horrible because there's there's a part of you that feels good when you're doing vegetarian and there's a part of you that feels good when you're doing vegan. And I think a lot of that is because you're not putting heavy things in your stomach. You don't get that weighed down feeling. Like when you eat a, um, you know, two or three quarter pound hamburger patties because you're hungry and you know that that's going to satisfy you. This is, this is kind of that um, addressing that whole starving while you're gorging thing. So you can eat non-nutritive food and you can feel lighter because there's no nutrition in it. It's just garbage that's expanding your stomach and causing those stretch receptors to expand, but they're not activating the nutrient receptors inside the stomach. And if they're not activating the nutrient receptors, you're going to keep eating. You're going to keep shoveling that garbage in. And it doesn't matter if it's, I, I've always said I was a volume eater. If you could give me a trough full of lettuce, a horse trough full of lettuce, I'd be happy as a clam and I'd just go through that. And, but it wouldn't have changed anything. It wouldn't have made my situation better because I know because I tried it. I tried the juicing, even though, although I did not put a lot of fruit in there because I knew that you needed, if you're going to eat fruit, you need the fiber in it. You need fiber. Ay, 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 ay. If I never hear that again in my life, I will be happy as can be. Um, just you don't. Uh, right now, my endocrinologist, I, I finally found an endocrinologist who actually was on board with doing the ketovore thing. And I'm like, okay, great. Let, let me try that. I'm going to go more carnivore, but that's okay. Um, so she's on board with that and we do our checks. My blood, uh, my A1C has gone from over 10. And I don't know what that is in, in the European or the not American measurements because y'all do minimals and stuff like that. But um, my A1C was over 10. I think it was 10.3 when I started with uh, Ketovore. And... Now, a year and a half later, um, it's down to 6.4. Oh, wow. That's a massive yeah. change. Yeah. And most importantly, so one of the best positives that I've had is in December of last year, December 30th, um, whenever I make a New Year's resolution, which I almost never do, um, I try to start it on the 30th or the 31st. So that way it's kind of like getting a running start at it. <laughs> it's like, oh, I did this okay. I did, you know, I started doing 100 squats a day because I had no leg strength. I couldn't, I, I couldn't push the portable machine around the hospital because I had no leg strength. I'd get tired just walking down one hallway to try and get to a patient's room. Um, 
So I started doing 100 squats a day, four sets of 25 at varying points throughout the day whenever I had a few extra minutes, managed that. And then on February 13th of this year, um, I, I don't remember whose video it was. It might've been one of yours. It might've been uh, a Dr. Barry, or it might've been a Dr. Bickman, or, you know, um, it, it could have been, um, was it, uh, Mm, um, high intensity, Tom, Tom Bilyeu. Um, but they were talking about sprinting and the benefits of sprinting. And my brain just went, Oh, you like sprinting. You've always liked sprinting because my little leggies, these short little stubby things, they're like little pistons. They just I, I, at my best, I could, um, I, I, when I was a teenager, my best sprint was, uh, I could do, uh, 50 yards or in, in under it, like 6.4 seconds. So I was pretty good at it, sprinting. Get, try and get me to do anything longer than that. No, I'm falling out. <clears throat> I'm gone. <laughs> but, and when I was doing that, then when I did that seven miles in that one hour, my top sprint was between 10 and 12 miles an hour. I maxed out my treadmill on that during my sprints. And they only lasted 20 to 30 seconds each. But it got me where I wanted to go. So on February 13th, I started sprinting again. Just I started off with just two 20-second sprints as fast as I could go. And I could only go five and a half miles an hour. Talk about a fall, a huge disappointing fall. But in between my balance had become so bad in part because of the neuropathy. You can't feel where your feet are. You have no proprioception. And February of 2023, my retina in my right eye detached. So I was blind in my right eye. Um, blood vessels burst back there. The retina peeled right off the back of the eyeball. And I, I was literally blind in one eye for over, or for actually that happened in, I want to say May of the previous year. So May of 22 is when that happened. I had just started a new job working for an orthopedic surgeon and, um, it started off with a floater. And it progressed and it progressed until November of that year. Six months later is when the retina detached. And I had to find an uh, ophthalmologist and go through all that. And then finally in February of last year, uh, I had what's called a vitrectomy. It's where they go in and they pull the uh, vitreous humor out of your eye. because And, and because it's all bloody. It's they, they they can't put it back. It's not like you can clean it. It's not like a dish you can clean and put back. But they went in and they reattached my retina to the back of the eye and they put a gas bubble in there. And you're only allowed to keep your head down for like, I don't know, I think it was like three or four days or something like that. You had to keep your head down so that the gas bubble pushes it up against the back of your eyeball and keeps it there so that the healing process can happen. So I'm still not 100% here, but at least I can tell that there are words on the screen. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched the original Star, Star Wars trilogy, uh, Return of the Jedi. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When Han gets freed from the carbonite and they're out on the, the desert going into the Sarlacc pit and he says, oh, instead of a big dark blur, it's all a big white blur. That's my right eye. <laughs> so. Um, but it's getting better little by little. And I think actually the carnivore is helping with that, um, which it, it's just such a blessing. So I might have to get a you know, different prescription. Fine. I'm fine with that as long as I get to keep my sight. Um, so it was horrifying, but then again, coming back to February 13th of this year, after seeing that, um, that video on the benefits of sprinting, I thought, wow, I can only do 5.5. But again, my balance was so horrible. I had still had no muscle regain or 
no muscle training from that point. All I was doing was the squat. So I had a month and a half of that. And, um, it was, it, I, I felt like I was just kind of all over the place on the treadmill. And I'm like, oh my God, this is terrible. And I wanted to hold on. But by the end of this month or um, by, what was it Tuesday? By Monday, <laughs> which is going to be April. Um, I have, I'm going to bump it up at least one sprint set. So I've been doing five to six 20 second sprints between five and a half and six miles an hour. Now, granted, I'm a lot older than I was back then when I was doing that, when I did that seven miles, but if I can get up somewhere between eight and 10 miles an hour consistently, I'll be happy as a clam. You know. And how are you feeling now that you've been doing it for, well, it's been over a month now, so uh, you're feeling better? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, absolutely. Um, I wish... I wish I could have done it before, but the neuropathy was just so bad. Uh, it finally started abating to the point where I could even contemplate the idea of pounding my feet on a treadmill. Um, and I want to say that that probably started maybe December of last year where the neuropathy was so much more manageable. It would it, It's always worse at night. So it would come on at night and... Um, you know, when it initially struck, I was using uh, Epsom salt rub. I was using Voltaren, the two of them together. Uh, I was taking um, the naproxen three or four times a day plus aspirin. And it was just insane. I was killing my liver, destroying my intestinal tract, just trying to keep this pain manageable so that I could function in my daily life. Um you know, I'm not married. I don't have kids. Um, there's, I have no family. So there was nobody that could support me through this except for me, which has always been fine. I've, uh, my whole thing is if you can't count on yourself, you can't count on anybody. And, you know, if you want somebody to help you, you have to lead the way by starting to help yourself. And that, that's always been my outlook on things. Um, so I had to take care of it myself. And as soon as I could, as soon as I could, I got off of all of those orals. I got off of the, um, the, uh, um, Voltaren and the Epsom salt gel. And occasionally if I'm having a bad day because of weather, the weather really affects it. It's weird. It's horrible. Um, then I have a CBD stick that I can just put very spot treat areas like, oh, my big toe's burning. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put a little bit of that on there. But other than that, I'm able to do my job. I'm able to stand. I'm able to walk the hospital. I'm able to push the portables. I'm able to help the patients. I'm able to um, push the carts. And it's, and, and, and I'm not screaming inside the whole time. And it's wonderful. And then starting that sprinting again has just been, oh my God. I'm in heaven. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and so how have you been eating to get to this point? Like what is a uh, daily a daily meal plan like for you? Well, um, most of the time I, I do have my coffee and um, I have my first cup. I, I've realized I don't deal well with high fat. Um, in January, I went through this high fat phase where I couldn't get enough. Everything had to have butter on it. I was whipping the cream. I, I, I bought an ice cream maker so that I could put the, the heavy cream in there and make ice cream. Um, and I, I think, I guess I had had enough. I gave my body enough fat to help heal my nerves more. So, um, I've never liked fatty meat. I can put butter on a lean cut of meat and I'm happy, but don't give me something that's all marbled and blah, blah. I peel off the fat from the bacon and I give it to the dog <laughs> and I eat the lean stuff. Uh, it's like that old Jack Spratt uh, nursery rhyme. Um, Jack Spratt could eat no fat. His wife could eat no lean. 
So, you know, between the two of them, they like their platters clean. Anyway, um, so I, I went through that high fat thing and then I realized I don't tolerate fat very well on the norm. So for the most part, I have been eating uh, lean meats and I do have my coffee in the morning. I really don't eat much before, say, like 10 o'clock. Um, if I do, I um, will, I make a lot of beef jerky. So uh, if I do have kind of a, a craving to gnaw on something, I'll grab a stick of beef jerky and I'll chew on that. Uh, share it with the dog, of course. Um, I, I dehydrate um, lunch meat as uh, meat chips, turkey chips, ham chips, chicken chips. <laughs> and, you know, we just kind of snack on that when I need a snack. I will make my own uh, Parmesan crisps because I like them. And one or two of those a day. And I'm usually fine. It doesn't upset my stomach or anything like that. It's because it, Parmesan's a harder cheese. It's much, you know, easier to digest. Um, so, you know, pretty much that. I buy the, uh, the sausage sticks and I'll cut them up and I'll bring them to work with me. Um, I'll, I'll buy, uh, you know, the jack's links or the equivalent of the jack's links one that's got the beef stick and then the cheese stick on the other one sometimes i'll eat the cheese stick sometimes i won't but and and i'm i'm loving it i can't do eggs anymore i think i've been buying the brown eggs and i think they're just i think the yolk is just too fatty so right now what i've got in the fridge is staying in the fridge <laughs> so and and um other than that i'm just really enjoying it um it, it feels good. When I started this whole journey, when I became, when I was diagnosed, I was over 200 pounds. And I'm only 5'3", well, now 5'2", because I'm 54. Uh, <laughs> but it, 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 uh, I was like 202, 203 pounds. And for my frame, that was, that was really morbidly obese. And I am currently at my last bathroom scale that's 20 years old um, weigh-in. Uh, I was down to 152. So, yeah. And I only do it because I know that the weight correlates to getting rid of the diabetes. So now my ideal weight, if I could get down to, or when I can get down to, ideally between 135 and 140, I'll be happy. I'll be happy because that means that I can go ahead and, you know, continue on with my weightlifting and my sprinting and get back into maybe some yoga and all those things that I miss so much. <laughs> nice. Someone's watching now that's got type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they've got the neuropathy and the similar kind of issues that everyone's yeah. dealing with. Um what advice would you give them to get started? Oh, uh, you know, I'd love to say take your time with it. But if you have neuropathy, uh, you have to balance the taking your time with the urgency of not letting your tissues and your extremities die. So if you're in that bad way, if you're already dealing with foot injuries, if you can't feel when you step on something, in a way, I was lucky because my neuropathy was so painful. I was aware of every breeze that crossed my feet. A lot of people don't get that when they get neuropathy. They get dead feet. They can't feel anything. So if that's where you're at, if you're already at a point where you're seeing injuries and sores and things like that, my best suggestion would be dive in head first, full carnivore, nothing but fatty meats right away. Do it for that 30 days. Suffer the keto flu, suffer what you got to suffer, suffer the diarrhea, suffer the, all of it. Because that is you cleansing yourself and getting rid of so much of this nasty stuff, the bile salts, the, the everything that's just been accumulating in your fat. Get rid of that as quickly as you can. And make sure that you take care of your extremities because that neuropathy, again, I understand why 
when you have it that bad, it can make you demand that somebody cut off your extremities, but that's not going to stop the problem. Neuropathy is systemic. Um, the nerve itself is your copper in your wiring. And the insulation is called the myelin sheath. And that insulation is made up of fat and cholesterol. And all these things that they tell you, oh, get your cholesterol down, get your, eat your fiber, get your cholesterol down, cholesterol, cholesterol, don't eat the fat. That is going to make it worse if you don't eat the fat. Um, there is a supplement called benfotamine. It is a synthetic B1. It stays in the body longer and it is great for regenerative, um, for myelin sheath regeneration. It is one of the, it, it's a, a, a B1 supplement. Uh, again, it's synthetic, but it's, that's what makes it work better. So get on your B vitamins, eat your liver. Okay. This is advice that I have not taken because ew, but you know, you can do, if you're going to save your feet, if you're going to save your toes, if you're going to save your legs, from, from knee down, you're going to do what you have to do. Cut up the liver, put it into chunks, throw it in the freezer, and just swallow them down frozen so you don't have to taste it. Um, do what you have to do and get yourself to a good endocrinologist. Okay, if you don't have a doctor, I know they're hard to come by, um, doctors who actually will support you in carnivore. But if you don't have time to shop for one, try and shop for an endocrinologist who understands and will support you at least give you the first 30 days of the benefit of the doubt. And then you'll see the results and you'll start seeing stuff immediately. If I had, do if I had dove in faster with carnivore, the way that I did with the veganism, I would probably have made, I'd probably have my A1C somewhere down around the fives the low fives by now. But I know myself, I'm a diet cheat. I always have been. Um, and when you're in healthcare, my God, please. If you're, if you're a drug rep or if you are somebody who goes to visit doctor's offices, for the love of God, stop buying junk food. Stop buying the donuts. Stop buying the cookies. Stop buying the candies for the staff. If you got to buy something that they're going to eat, get them some, get them some beef jerky. I know it's more expensive, but for the love of God, um, those who know, those who are in the know will love you more for it. And they'll be more likely to take you seriously as a drug rep or as a salesperson, um, you know, or better yet, just buy the stress balls, <laughs> you know, whatever works. Um, but if you have to go with food, uh, yeah, uh, for those of you who are suffering with the neuropathy and the type 2 diabetes, if you don't know which way to turn, turn to carnivore, dive in head first, um, because it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to do anything but help you. And even if it takes the pain away for a little bit so that you can think more clearly about what your next step is going to be, that's worth it right there. So. Nice. Thank you. Um, so, um, Jill, how can people reach out to you? Do you have some social media or any website or anything? I do. Um, I have a, uh, my, as you can see on my uh, tag there, it's um, at J.A. Carlton Author. That's my YouTube channel. Um, that's, I, oh, <laughs> I call it Living in Hope. And um, I have actually put up, I believe, the full version of uh, one of my books up there. It's um, been recently retitled. Uh, it was uh, originally titled At the Crossroads, The Destiny of Choice. But um, it's been retitled now, and uh, it's still listed as At the Crossroads, Destiny of Choice. I also have Small Secrets, Big Rewards, which are just little tidbits of tips um, about how to focus on your needs. Um, we get so wrapped up 
and healthcare people do too, especially, we get so wrapped up in the idea that we're serving other people, serving other people that we forget to take care of ourselves because unless we do, we can't help others. Um, and my website is just jacarlton.com. Jill, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. And I'm very happy to hear you're doing so so much better now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I can't tell you how much it means um, to be able to come on and share this. Um, I didn't think I had much to say, um, especially like on my on the, on the YouTube channel. I, I thought I had kind of run out of positive things, but seeing all the stories that you're promoting and just seeing how well and and how thoroughly you're reaching out to the people around you. It's very inspiring. So thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.